Mitchell. Welcome to the Museum Roadshow here at the Becker County Museum. Today we're going to continue our interview with Ken Larson from Pelican Rapids, sharing his experiences from World War II. I was what they call an electrician, and our job was to operate the motors and the, uh, keep the speeds of the engines. And we, when we dove, we had to shut down all the engines and shift the battery power. and. The engines were all coupled right to a generator, and then they'd turn them over to us. We could either, with this control, we could put some on battery charging, some on propulsion. But we had to come up every night to charge the batteries. So then we'd go out on what they call patrols, you know. Uh, well, first we had to, we had to get way out in the Pacific. We went to probably, two weeks to get out to Saipan and we got fueled up there again and then we go out into we hidden around all the Ch South China Sea and Yellow Ocean, all around through Japan and there and what we do is they give you a, an area of patrol send each boat to a certain area and you stay submerged pretty near all day and uh, surface at night and then they they give them orders they probably know that there's a convoy at certain certain location and we should go that way try and get in the front of them and we operated and they call it a wolf pack about three or four boats and I think it was the sunfish we heard an explosion and found out that it was the sunfish that was with us. And we figured that had a mine. We were always around minefields and stuff. And, uh, and a few of the uh, submarines were sunk by accident. We had a couple of times that when we were diving that just went down too fast and we couldn't get it stopped. In fact, we'd get below where we should be by the time you got the darn thing coming up. So I think quite a few of them were, were uh, sunk that way. And a few of them were sank with their own torpedoes at the beginning of the war. They'd come right back at you, I guess. We patrolled an area, say, they'd give me an area of so many miles. All we do is wait there for ships to come by, some uh, Japanese ships, and uh, try and sink them. So they couldn't get supplies to these islands that they were trying to hang on to. And uh, we had some pretty good intelligence because I know we'd surface at night and they'd get the, uh, that's when we got all the communications. And they'd say a certain amount of ships are leaving a certain harbor at a certain time, heading in a certain direction. So try and get over in that area. So, so we knew what was, they, they, they had pretty good intelligence. Uh, we had uh, far better radar than they had, and we did have some advantages. Uh, first patrol, we sank a tanker and uh, damaged a few more ships and uh, got depth charged quite a few times. And uh, that, that patrol lasted 60 some days. And we finally were sent for uh, rehab and uh, refit the boat at uh, Perth, Australia, which we spent a couple of weeks there and uh, out there the next time, and same thing and the same thing. We were very heavily damaged the third patrol. In fact, uh, we got depth charge bad enough that it cracked the main, uh, crank, uh, bases on the main engines and blew our gyro compasses out of their mercury pots and cracked two of our uh, hatches and and uh, busted all the light bulbs, of course. And I don't know how we got out of that. We took 70-some depth charges, and uh, 
Uh, then we could, you know, when you're getting to, these boats going over you, you can hear them. You can hear the screws them going over you. You can hear the depth charges hitting the water. You can hear a click and they're detonating. And you can hear the explosion because it'll really shake you. And uh, nothing you can do. Walk around in your stocking, stocking feet. Everything shut off, everything. We were laying on the bottom and we were got stuck in 150 feet of water, which isn't good. We should be in 300 feet of water, but we were in the mud there. You were pretty well trapped there, but I don't know. It probably wasn't any worse than being in a foxhole, so I don't know. <laughs> No, it's it, like the guy said, if you weren't scared, you were crazy, so you were scared. I was ready to quit when it was over. Finally got, we could hear, evidently, some friendly planes come over and seeing what was going on, and we could hear the ships above us getting sca uh, scraped, you know, and pretty soon, uh, it quieted down, they seemed to have left and it got dark and we finally got back on the surface again. But we weren't in very good shape, so we got things going as best we could and they sent us back to uh, Perth, Australia. And they refitted the boat again and thought they had it fixed up and sent us out and everything went to pot. So. Then they had to send us back to Pearl Harbor. They were going to send us to the States, so goody-goody, we thought. No, they decided at Pearl Harbor they could fix us up, which they did, and then we went on a, a fourth patrol. I think the, about the most scary thing we done once we... Do you know what gorillas are? Gorillas are, well, like uh, the Japanese took over the Philippines, and there was a lot of... Uh, Philippine army and stuff and didn't surrender. They just went back in the jungles and and made life miserable for whatever they could do. But anyway, they would uh, uh, learn where the Japanese had most of their uh, armor and where they were uh, uh, most susceptible to us invading and stuff and. We were supposed to meet with these gorillas and get, they were going to give us some information and send it out so, so we'd have a better idea of where, we could, where they could invade. Uh, that was Mindanao is the name of the island. And uh, the first night we didn't get the signal to go in and the second night finally did. I think they were flashing up in the mountain and we had to go in this shallow bay we didn't like that because if we were caught on the surface we were dead ducks you know but here are these four or five gorillas come rowing out in a regular outrigger and they had a bundle that looked like a big bag like a mail bag and they give it to us and I remember I was on lookout that night, and the captain says, well, we're heading in. Whatever we got in this boat that you want, you can have. I want food? No. Guns, you know. So we had, a, we had shotguns, and we had 45s and a few small arms. Boy, they wanted that. <laughs> they were tough looking. They said, uh, well, if you could have got in last night, we had two prisoners for you. But he says, they got kind of ornery, so we haven't got them anymore. <laughs> Ooh, they looked ornery themselves. <laughs> we took that bag and went out when we got on to the friendly waters and met a, it was an Australian ship, and give that to, information to them. And, and within a month or so, then we invaded that island. So these gorillas had given a lot of information of where our gun replacements were and 
I imagine. I didn't read what was in there. And then the fifth patrol we were on, we'd done a lot of lifeguard duty with our, uh, the shipping, Japanese shipping had kind of wasn't much left to going on because we had them pretty well whipped. And we were doing this lifeguard duty. We could hear the uh, B-29s bombing Tokyo and listening to, we could listen to their radios and hear them talking. Man, a lot of them we were to pick up survivors. We never picked any up. We went to some, but most of them got picked up before we got there. But when the war ended, we were right off the coast of Japan and we hung around after they signed the peace treaty, then we hung around. And I don't know why, the Yellow Sea was full of floating mines. And we were in there shooting them up. And a, when a mine comes, it gets uh, away from its morning, you know, it automatically, it isn't charged anymore. It won't detonate. Uh, of course, that's, the Japs didn't want them floating around either, so but we'd shoot them up with uh, 20 millimeters. That would blow them up. But we, we shot up a, bring her 100 mines running around there. Finally, they sent us home. But that was in their Navy three years and nine days, and I wasn't old enough to buy a beer when I got out. I had one one day. <laughs> well, this is a... Uh, the USS Blackfin were pulling into San Diego after the war. And this is some of the pictures. Most of these were all taken on our way back to the States because uh, we were never on the outside of the boat uh, when we were in war zone, so we didn't get any pictures. Well, this is just a bunch of us sitting up on the deck this is a picture of us. We got caught in what they call the, the Okinawa typhoon. You had to strap yourself in a bunk when you wanted to go to sleep. This is a picture of a, this is a tender, and these are submarines tied up to it. So you can see how big a tender looks, how little we look sitting there. This is a picture of guys standing lookout. There's their little uh, cages up on the lower part of the torpedo are the periscopes where you stood watch. Here we're in dry dock. We had to change one of the, we call them screws, propellers, because if they get out of uh, whack a little bit, they're noisy and you have, to, you have to replace them. This is a picture of us in the compartment where I stood watch, which was uh, called the control room. This is a picture of a couple of guys by one of our guns. We had three surface guns, a 20 millimeter, a 50 millimeter, and a five inch. But the only thing we used them for was to blow up mines. I think they finally decided they didn't put deck guns on submarines anymore. Thank you for joining us for today's show when we learned about Ken's experiences in World War II. Ken did pass away in January of 2018 and it serves as a good reminder that we really want to get those, your story captured. Veterans, especially you, we need to share those experiences with our younger generation so we can learn for the future.